able to layer that data against weather, special events, and other things. So we're able to see what happens um, on the pedestrian level, which is really helpful, but it's also another great retail retu recruitment tool. Retailers love to know how many people walk in front of their storefront and on their block. We, of course, track occupancy rates, uh, parking and transit information. So we know how many people are in the decks. Uh, we know who rides what route, how many people are at a stop. We track every development in downtown in the pipeline, recently constructed and planned. And then we do retail gap analysis to figure out what we so I can see so, what effects. Uh, when we first started this retail recruitment work, grocery store was the big thing. We could talk about other gaps, but that was the gap people wanted to fill. And I'll get to this in a moment, but we filled that gap. So we're at a new level of granularity on what are those gaps we're missing? Are we missing a shoe store? Are we missing a laundromat? Are we missing um, other types of retail? And when we have that gap analysis, it allows us to focus our resources and target. Uh, so that's how we recruit. We use data, we identify prospects, and we make contact with them. So we look at that gap, we see what are we missing? What do we need? What do we think we can get? We try to, we try to chase realistic prospects. Um, so for example, we have a lot of stores down here where downtown is their second, third, or fourth location. They're locally owned, but we're not their first necessarily, uh, which is a good thing because downtown is a more expensive submarket than some of the others in the region. So they can be patient with downtown's growth. And as long as the store is not losing money, they have other stores in their local chain. And so called chainlets. Um, and so downtown, we've had a lot of success uh, identifying those type of prospects. We do matchmaking with landlords. So we'll listen to what the prospect is looking for. We have an inventory of every single vacancy in downtown Raleigh. And we will um, look at that vacancy list and try to match them. Um, we have we help them clear hurdles so that's regulatory whether it's permitting um, other issues and then we also have a retail upfit grant which is a small grant program to help with early startup costs it's tied to business planning and financial planning so it's meant to incentivize good business planning and financial planning so what else helps these are the things that you can't necessarily control as easily but to chris's earlier point about land use uh, you need more residents you need more office workers more visitors more people is really helpful Again, retail is driven by people. Um, and so you gotta be able to demonstrate that there's gonna be people outside their door and that they're gonna be able to bring them in. Um, you need interested landlords. So cultivating your relationships at the landlord level is really in, uh, important. We've been able to do that with several key landlords who understand the value of ground floor. And particularly understanding that your ground floor can drive your upper floor rents. So if you have a really dynamic ground floor, you, you can afford to give a little on that because you'll get it on your upper floors, right? Your office and your residential will lease at a higher rate if your ground floor is compelling. Uh, wayfinding is important. Uh, so signage and maps and ways to find that retail. And then we do a lot of promotions like First Friday and Small Business Saturday and things along those lines. So the success we've had, we managed to recruit not just one, but two grocery stores. Uh, we recruited a, a locally owned, um, Co-op, that's a, the best way to think of it is a locally owned version of Whole Foods. You can see a picture of them up in the top right corner, um, which is super cool, uh, really great urban format grocery store. And then we recruited a Publix, which is a national chain out of Florida, uh, heavy presence here in the Southeast. They will be opening at the end of the summer, a 50,000 square foot urban format store. We also recruited bookstores, hardware, outdoor wear, uh, women's apparel, uh, flowers, pharmacy, gourmet, records, plants, home goods, and pet store. So we've had a lot of success. We've managed to keep it 93% uh, locally owned, uh, which is compelling. And that is that is the competitive edge we put against the rest of the retail centers in the region. So, you know, if you go into a mall versus downtown, I can't really compete with you on parking necessarily. There's a conception of mall parking as free and easy-ish. Uh, but I can compete on tenant mix, right? I can say that we are unique because we have a 93% locally owned base. That's also a stat that's really helpful for recruitment. Other locally owned retailers wanna be with each other. And so it creates a momentum that we've been able to maintain. Um, another thing we were able to do is we were able to get the YMCA to return um, to downtown Raleigh. So you can see them here in the middle, uh, top middle there, the YMCA returned to uh, Fayetteville Street, which is our main street. Um, and you can see some of these other storefronts. These are other storefronts of businesses we recruited. Um, and all of these were um, received uh, retail upfit grants from us as well to help uh, improve the aesthetics of their storefronts. So you can see it literally and physically changes your storefront economy when you're able to recruit these things. 
So some of our major challenges, now I'll note that these were major challenges prior to the crises we're in. Um, so rent and rising land costs were a, a challenge for us. Um, I think we may see rent stall for a bit, maybe even fall back a little bit, but I don't think it'll stay that way for a real long time. We had limited viable space because we had a very low vacancy rate. Our restaurants and bars were thriving, so they're outbidding uh, retail. Um, we have dispersed retail. It's not all on one street, unfortunately. And then parking was a challenge. So the other thing I'd say when you're building up an economic development program is you always need to know your threats. And these are some of our threats. And so you need to be focused on those as well because they can erode your success very quickly. Another thing we did were pop-ups. Um, so um, we, we use this, and this is gonna be a really important strategy now here in the near term. We developed relationships with landlords to activate long-term empty storefronts that were empty for various reasons. They had future plans, they wanted to sell the building, they're absentee, there's a lot of different reasons. And so we're able to test and demonstrate retail concepts in there. Uh, we're able to attract the attention of other retailers and we're able to add to our shopping base really quickly and generate lots of media attention. So we started this program in 2015. Uh, we've done at this point a dozen pop-ups uh, in downtown Raleigh. This is an example. This is what the storefront looked like before, uh, not very attractive. And then you can see what we've done with it since. So we've had um, artist collective here. We had a local cell phone company here. We had a craft store. Um, we've had two boutiques. Uh, we currently have a pie shop there, um, which is pretty cool. We also had arts, so you can see the, the glowing lights here. We did this during a period where retail was going to be quiet. It was during the winter months, uh, right after Christmas. So we put in a light installation, uh, which was really, really cool, very well received. It had motion sensors on the front of the storefront. So when you walked by, it, the lights started lighting up and following you. So people would dance in front of it. It's a really cool activation. So. Um, that's, that's something we've been able to do with our empty storefronts that unfortunately we're gonna have to do a lot more here in the near term. The other thing we've done that added to this program is our minority and women owned business support. So we partnered with a local community college that has an entrepreneurship program. One thing about economic development is not reinventing the wheel, right? So I can't train an entrepreneur nearly as well as a community college can. I have a staff of 10 people, but I know how to find space. I know how to get people into that space and activate it quickly. So we partnered with a local community college. We built an application process. We chose our initial entrepreneurs. We offered six month leases. And now we're about to expand the program to a much larger space on Fayetteville Street, our main street. So it's been a nice success. I'm glad we started this program. It's something that is already built and the infrastructure is there. So we don't have to do it um, sort of on, on the fly now. We know how to do it. So as we're emerging out of the COVID crisis, um, it is a way to respond to concerns around diversity uh, in our storefront mix and amongst our storefront owners in downtown. So overall, what did retail recruitment and economic development add to our organization? So for one, it literally changed the, the downtown storefront economy. So um, I absolutely believe that we were able to get in tenants who would not have otherwise come. One of those grocery stores was never gonna look at downtown Raleigh if we hadn't turned their heads. So it has changed the storefront economy here. Um, we built value add to landlords by connecting with tenants and improving the mix. So our landlords see the value of our organization because they see tenants. Uh, to give you an example, those two grocery stores that we help bring to downtown, the collective value of their leases is over $20 million. So that's a lot of value driven to a landlord um, by making those connections. And those are, they both have long-term leases in downtown Raleigh. You can see in the chart there, the net gain of businesses by storefront classification We've been able to bump retail above all other types of storefront um, by being active and engaged on it. Uh, it's a value add to the real estate community through the data. So again, the real estate community loves having that data for prospects, particularly in a hot submarket like ours, uh, but they don't have the time to get to that granularity. We do it for them. We provide the data for them. We provide tours. We'll sit down with their prospects. So it's a real value add to them, but we also funnel them prospects as well. So it's extra eyes um, looking for prospects. Uh, one thing that I would emphasize, it has absolutely increased our influence at City Hall uh, because we are trusted based on our data and our recruitment reputation. So we get asked all the time, what do you think? Um, what do you want to do here? I'll tell you the outdoor dining expansion policy we have here in Raleigh, we had an enormous amount of influence on. Uh, we helped write it. There are portions of it that we did write because of the influence we have from this program. So we sort of earned our seat at the table by having such a robust economic development program. 
Uh, part of it is also because we built relationships. So when you literally recruit all these businesses, you have these relationships that last and pay dividends. And so it's happening now. Those are people who trust us, who we have a good relationship with. We get a lot of communication. And that's information that the city, the public, the private sector are all interested in. And frankly, it's our most well-regarded service. So um, when we went through our strategic plan uh, over two years ago, it was consistently ranked as our most well-regarded service. So it's been something that's really elevated our organization. So I'm going to stop there um, and thank you guys for having me. But I'm here to take uh, any questions. So I'm going to I'm going to take myself out of screen sharing so I can see you guys. But um, are there any questions? That's really excellent. Thanks, Bill. I have a quick question. Uh, how did you deal with um, you know let's let's call them the absentee landlord, the landlord who just doesn't seem to care? Um, were you able to get you know attract their interest? Was it the matchmaking with re retailers, or how did you move move them? Yeah, so we've been able to do matchmaking. We have one landlord in particular who is, um, I think, sort of considered an absentee, um, who can be, who's been challenging. Um, but what we did was we did some matchmaking. We got them in particular early on a tenant, which has worked really well for them. And so they saw a lot of value. They were a good tenant. They added other tenants and attracted foot traffic. Uh, and so we've been able to work with them. You know, I can't promise that it's always easy. Um, some absentee landlords are, are challenging to work with. But that pop-up space, for example, we used, that was an absentee landlord as well. And we basically said, if you'll give us the keys, we'll make this cool. You'll get some revenue off of it and you won't need to worry about it for a while. And it'll be good for your image. And whenever you're actually ready to do something with this, um, the, the space will have been activated and on the radar longer. And so um, sometimes it's about figuring out what people's motivations are and understanding how to get there. Occasionally you don't get it, right? There's We've had a couple of buildings we just cannot cannot penetrate their thinking. They just, they just have this idea that tomorrow's the day they're going to sell it for double what it's worth. And so you just can't get them there. Um, but we've, we've won more than we've lost in that regard. Right. Great. May I ask, uh, how did you go about the, the, the uh, before and after photographs you showed were very, very compelling. How were those costs shared, you know, to get it from an old, old, old shell to a nice new attractive shell? Um, that's a great question. So we as an organization um, had some of those costs and so we paid for um, the flooring and so if you think of it as we thought of it as what are the costs that if you shook that storefront up um, would stay right because then we could keep using the storefront so we paid for the flooring and the painting on the walls um, but then the tenants themselves did all of the fixtures the first one we did all of the fixtures were recyclable so they did everything out of cardboard boxes which was really cool it looked really nice uh, but they did everything recyclable. So we paid for the basic upfit costs to get it up to um, a reusable sort of standard with the flooring and the walls. Uh, and we also did some lighting and it really wasn't actually all that expensive. I mean, we probably spent to get that storefront activated. I think we spent, you know, less than $2,000. Now you're not going to get to do that, you know, for all storefronts, but I think if you can see it as that investment, we've had the storefront for five years. So we've gotten an enormous amount out of it. Um, so we, we paid for basic upfit costs and then the tenants paid to um, do the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually have a, quite, a couple of questions for you, Bill. This sure. is uh, Dave Guida. The, I'll, I'll ask the two and then maybe you can respond to them. Uh, first of all, you talked about the pedestrian counts. Uh, how did you do those pedestrian counts with, uh, with a camera just to input? counts or was there some other mechanism? And then the second question, I'm assuming that initially your, the charter of, of your bid organization was not economic development. And could you talk a little bit about how, the, how that process actually happened? Was it, was it endorsed by the whole board or did you have to sell it? Or you know, how was that whole process introduced? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll start with the pedestrian counter. We use a company called uh, Eco Counter, and they are little boxes that we attach to um, essentially telephone poles or street lamps, I should say. We don't have telephone poles. We have street lamps, and they shoot out essentially little infrared lasers, and then they track every time somebody walks in front of it, it counts as a person. You can also use groups that do cameras. They're just they're more expensive, and so you have to do sort of a cost benefit analysis. We made the decision to go with the, the ones that shoot essentially little lasers because um, we could buy more of them. So we could deploy more of them. 
uh, and we can also move them easily. And so if we really need to move them, we can, and that's, it's not a big deal. Literally, it's one of my staff goes out and unscrews it from a pole and screws it to a new pole. So we made that choice. We do audit them um, by person, uh, usually quarterly to see, to make sure that they're, they're accurate. So I'll have somebody sit there for a couple hours and they'll, they'll do a hand count. And so they'll see, okay, I saw 248 people go by. The little box said 288 people came by. And so then they'll be able to sort of say, okay, there's a little bit of a delta here. So we factor that in when we look at the data. Um, so yeah, we have eco counters located around and they just, they, they're infrared laser. Um, for the, the evolution in the organization, um, the organization started well before my time. And I think um, you sort of clean and safe was a big part of it. So uh, those services were, were core and safety was particularly important because um, there was nobody down here. Again, this was a completely dead government center. Um, and then it evolved to include economic development, uh, but it took time to do that. Uh, it, by the time I got here, economic development was a um, sort of the part of the charter. It just wasn't a very well executed or robust or developed one. Um, but the board was absolutely supportive of that. And then really the city helped drive that too. And so the city saying, um, we put all this money into this downtown. For example, we put all this money into your main street. We need you guys to figure out how to activate it. We need you guys to figure out how to fill these storefronts. We don't know how to do that. And so uh, the city was a big part of that. So they actually contribute a, um, in addition to our um, bid money, we do get an extra contract for them um, for economic development services, particularly on a storefront level. So they actually do fund that each year. It's not an enormous contract, but it does help. It helps me cover another staff member, which is really helpful. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Very interesting. Any other questions for Bill? Chris, do you want to add your perspective? Because I know I'm sure you have one since you were involved in Raleigh. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, dating back to the, the time when Bill was, was, was hearkening back to when downtown was dead, um, you know, oftentimes it was the motivation of being called Deadsville in the New York Times. Uh, there was a writer that had visited Raleigh in 02 um, and, and wrote that story. And uh, that really serves as motivation sometimes to get stakeholders and, and government to uh, overcome those types of labels. I think it's not very different than uh, Hollywood being labeled as a tourist trap and, you know, the worst place to visit or whatever that, that, uh, that, that came out last year. Uh, it serves as motivation for us to get much more proactive and own the solutions to those challenges. Um, and that's where I just see a tremendous opportunity for this organization. Uh, we do have, you know, good relationships with many, many property owners in the district. Um, they are obviously sort of all in it together and they support the bid because of that sentiment. Um, and, you know, this is, it's a direct service that while our organization does not have a um, you know, a, a great legacy within. Um, it is certainly within the auspices of, of many bids around the country. There's over 2,500 bids um, and many bids are demonstrating a lot of success on this front um, because it really, it pulls the mission out of the broker's mindset on this, which is commission, right? And it looks at that mission orientation in helping to create something that is greater than the sum of its individual parts. And that's where I just see as an organization, and we're going to hear in the board meeting as a part of some budget amendments that I'm going to begin socializing, uh, is that I think that this is a real opportunity for us to accelerate um, our economic development program. In our strategic plan, we've identified it as a goal three, excuse me, a year three objective. Um, and we are finishing year one right now. Um, you know, I would propose that we begin thinking about how to uh, staff up and prepare uh, to really own the opportunity that's in front of us over the next two quarters as we look at additional attrition on the boulevard and what we can do to better, better reposition that asset um, to be more sustainable um, as, as, a, as a destination, not only for, for tourists, but for the neighborhood and for all Angelinos. And I think that that's a part of my broader vision is, is to make Hollywood Boulevard, a place that Angelinos are proud to share with, with their friends and neighbors. Yeah, I think we all share in that vision. In the, in the past, I've had some skepticism, I think, be, based on our experience of dealing with owners and, and our many unsuccessful uh, attempts to kind of improve the, 
the, the retail mix on the boulevard. But I just feel like we're in such desperate times right now that it, you know it's this is worth an effort. And I think uh, Bill made a very compelling case, and Chris, you make a compelling case as well that you know this can really result in success. And it's a also a community building exercise, which is definitely a a, a, a core mission of our organization. Um, so I, I'm all for giving it a try. I'd love to hear what other committee members think, whether they're uh, they're, they're supportive or any objections. Cool. Well, it, it might be worth hearing more of a, a specific plan from you, Chris, like what next steps would be. But I, I'd love to hear what other committee members think about it. Well, one thing, one thing that I, I have is, you know, I, when we set those priorities up, I think it was a whole different place in time. Right. And if we go back now, if it's worth at least kind of doing a short review to see that have those priorities changed because of what just happened or is happening. Yeah. Uh, I think it does. Yeah, absolutely. I have a thought, if I might add. Um, hi, everyone. I hope Amen. you're all doing well. You know, Mike, I think you said it really well, but I would actually just add, I don't know if there have been many, I don't think there have been many collective attempts to improve or change or modify the retail mix. And I do think that, you know, to Chris's point and under his uh, leadership, it, the bid, the Hollywood partnership, excuse me, uh, is in a unique position to, you know, play that role uh, along and like, I'm certainly here to be a part of it any way that I can. Um, and I actually, you know, about the point about residents, Chris and I were speaking with some residents earlier today, uh, along with Devin and I think the, you know, improvements that we want to see and want to bring to the public right of way um, to make it a more pleasant place to be, dovetail with all of this Absolutely. really, really nicely. Right, right, right. I, uh, <clears throat> Michael, uh, it's Drew. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I'm I'm a supporter of it, uh, but I, I look at it m maybe a little bit differently, maybe not. But I look at this as you know, I don't know. I've never done business in in Raleigh, uh, so I don't know how difficult the the city uh, is. But I think, and, and Dan, I, I mean, you know we love you and I mean no disrespect to you, but Los Angeles- I know is, where you're going, we're good. We're good. It's, it's, we love you, Dan. Uh, it, it's a notoriously difficult place to get things through our, our, our city for all kinds of reasons. And that's just, that's just what it is. So I would say that I, I would be very supportive of trying to um, uh, adopt the, the Raleigh re retail uh, you know, enlivenment strategy. But I would also say that we're going to need uh, support support from the legislative perspective because if 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 it's I, I have to believe that Raleigh is no more difficult. That's my assumption that it's no more difficult to do things in Raleigh than it is Los Angeles, and arguably a lot easier, uh, especially when you've got the city looking to renovate an area, gentrify. Would I, that's a bad word. In any case, enliven an area, and I, I, you know, for example, you know, the permitting process could take as long as this, you know could take longer than, than the pop-up to get the pop-up in there could take longer than the pop-up's going to be there. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's a, that's a dispiriting process. So I, I would say, yes, I'm all in. I would also say I would, I would look to the council office uh, to, to give us some assistance as we need with respect to the difficult entitlement process that we always deal with. Okay. That's great, Drew. Thank you. And, and I'm in complete agreement with those sentiments. I think we all are. So, so maybe the next step would be for Chris to, to uh, you know, propose, um, I guess, a series of uh, next steps and any hirings uh, to the committee so we can discuss it and then eventually bring it to the full board. Is, does, would that make sense, Chris? Yeah, so, so what I'm going to do at the board meeting is I'm going to present an overview of, um, of, of where we are with this year's budget. Um, and um, it's, I think, leading into a budget amendment package that I'm going to advance in July for the full board's consideration. Um, and before I sort of get too far ahead of the board, um, I really wanted just to ensure like this committee is going to be overseeing this scope of work. Um, and I think it's a big part of, of a pivot that needs to occur. Um, as Dave rightly pointed out, I mean, everything has changed um, since we adopted that strategic plan. Um, and our organization has the opportunity to, to pivot uh, with the environment. And, um, and so the, I think this will be one amongst a handful of other recommendations, which are basically 
all going to be coming from that slide deck, um, the recovery deck that I just ran through again for you all um, about opportunities for us to, to really sort of own that future in a way and, and make sure that we're investing in the right ways. Um, but I would like to bring that back to this committee next month for their support and show you, just sort of unpack it and show you what it means. Uh, but in total, I'm seeing about a quarter million um, in our budget that is an opportunity fund, as I'm calling it, to reallocate strategically to address uh, these new priorities. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to reviewing that. And if you want to uh, you know, discuss it in between uh, meetings, we're happy to do that as well. I mean, I think it's important. And I think it's um, you know, not only does it make sense to, to pivot, given that the world has changed, but it actually, considering what's happened out there, it may actually present an opportunity to change finally the re, the you know just the mix of Hollywood Boulevard for the better. Um, you know maybe this is going to force the issue. So um, you know let's put in the effort. Let's see if we can make it happen. Thanks, Mike, and thanks, Bill. I know you've got to run. Um, yeah, Bill, so thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Chris, did you want to, uh, anything else? You want to move on to the um, I think we can, reports? Yeah, I think we can move on to our partner reports. Okay, partner reports. Ron, are you here? Let's see. Is Ron here? She's here, yeah, she's on. I'm here. here, I'm just unmuting. Oh, Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank you, thank you Michael. Um, I don't know that we have, we've been working a lot on advocacy. Um, we have presented to the city Yesterday, some recommendation for uh, a faster economic recovery. Uh, they were along the line of talking about signage, parking, um, expansion on sidewalk, just like Chris mentioned earlier, the mayor's program and expressing support of that for restaurants to exp uh, expand their operations. Uh, we were also drafted letter of recommendations for the county and the state um, and have taken many positions on many bills yesterday. So really busy on the advocacy front. We keep putting all that information in our, in our e-news. If anybody is interested, let me know and we'll be happy to add you so you can receive these updates from the chamber. Um, but we're still operating virtually and um, really glad to be partnering up with the bid on the restoration of the Walk of Fame and working with Chris, doing a terrific job on keeping top end on track. Um, and providing great updates throughout the protests and the riots and just keeping us all informed. So I'm just going to say thank you to Chris for his leadership on that. Hey, thanks, Rana. I have a, I have a question for Rana. Uh, Rana, can, can you give an update or at least the status on the, I saw you guys did the 2021 star uh, stars, but is, is it going to continue to be uh, like a Zoom stars or when is it going to return to, you know, we had a call with um, the county today. We could fall literally for Walk of Fame ceremony, and I had to reach out to them because I just talked to the county today. We could fall under filming, and we could fall under small gatherings. Small gatherings in the state of California are still not legally allowed, except for churches and things like that. Um, so for now, under small gathering, we really can't do it. We talked today about um, fitting under permitting um, for filming, and it limits the audience a lot. Um, we have some recommendations that I need to discuss internally with them and um, with LAPD to see the feasibility of them. If we were to able to do the ceremony and just broadcast them on social media, uh, but it's something for us to discuss. It's still a work in progress, unfortunately. Till they relax the guidelines for small gathering, it's going to be quite challenging to uh, accommodate a star installation unless we do it with very, very limited audience. Okay, thank you. You're okay. welcome. Dan, update on uh, Heart of Hollywood? Sure, thanks. So the, um, the Walk of Fame Master Plan Project is officially in its schematic design phase, and I hope to go into some more of these details uh, for those who are interested in attending the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce Leadership in Action Town Hall featuring Dan Halden on July 8th at 1 o'clock p.m., I will, <laughs> I will go into more detail on that. Um, but we have Gensler doing a bunch of boring technical work, um, which by the end of this summer, I hope to have a much clearer um, idea 
uh, even before the end of the summer, but just to lower the expectations, uh, just in terms of like utilities and stuff like that. And that's really going to inform the specifics of, you know, how wide do we think we can get our sidewalks um, during the schematic design phase, which will be at least, you know, likely through the end of the year, um, barring any more pandemics uh, or protests. Uh, there will be a, a ongoing opportunities for community engagement, so I will keep you all posted on that. Um, in addition to that, while we are doing that work behind the scenes, we can. Uh, I'm going to probably start our virtual restart our virtual roundtables next week. It did not seem appropriate to do it in light of everything that's been going on in recent weeks, um, and we're also actively going after um, different funding sources. I think that's something that I've talked. Um, a little bit about here uh, over the last uh, couple of months. So none of that is guaranteed, but somewhere in the hopper are three different uh, potential funding opportunities for us. One at the county level, one at the state level, and one at the federal level actually, which uh, came our way uh, through the CARES Act. So hopefully, you know, I, I believe that we will be able to make a case um, and Chris and Cassie, I'll let you know if we need any additional data. Uh, but I think we can make a case that COVID-19 has had or will have an economic impact on the Hollywood community. Uh, and hopefully we are able to get some uh, money uh, for uh, Hollywood Boulevard out of it. So I'll keep you posted. Keep your fingers crossed, please. Right. Thanks, Dan. Okay, any um, update on the Hollywood community plan update? Chris, do you know? The um, only thing I have, and, and sorry, I'm going to have to like punt to the board meeting on this. Um, our legal counsel will be providing an update to the board during new business um, on the pending lawsuit filed by Hollywood Heritage, um, which um, followed the CRA's tabling of the ur urban design guidelines last mm -hmm. November. Okay. Um, so, so Jeff is going to be at the full board. Uh, he's been uh, going through the um, all of the, the lawsuits, and um, I think he wants to provide a, a, a full board update about that. I understand from work, talking to Dan's uh, colleague over in the council office, uh, Craig Bullock, who is the, uh, the council member's planning director, um, that the Department of City Planning is currently thinking about um, uh, releasing the new draft in July of this year, and then initiating um, a public engagement process thereafter. Um, I can't necessarily confirm that timeline because things could slip. Um, when I did see their presentation at the, the Chamber's Economic Development Committee back in, oh gosh, February, maybe January, um, which feels like seven years ago at this stage, um, they were talking about releasing it in March um, and that obviously did not occur. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, th that's just what I know at this time, but I do think that that update on the legal front is important um, sure. be because I think it's um, it's critical that we understand how other stakeholders can be involved in the development of the plan. Okay, thank yeah. you, Chris. Any, uh, any new business? Looks Chris, like real yeah. quick, oh, sorry, a question. Then, did you uh, mention, or did anybody mention anything about the restaurant beverage program? Because I have one little update on that, if that's of interest to anyone. Yeah, let's, let's, let's why, yeah, why don't you update that? So if, uh, the, I will send this out to you. I think I had sent it out before for one of the webinars. This is a potential new program being developed by the city planning department that essentially if, would allow for a, uh, a restaurant or, or an establishment that serves alcohol, as long as you have food as like the primary component, uh, to be able to get up and running without uh, having to go through the more laborious conditional use permitting process, provided that you are adhering to a preset uh, like list of conditions, including hours, you know, number of like patrons, et cetera, that is going to be heard uh, at the city planning commission next week June 25th, and that will be at, I think, eight, yeah, 8.30 in the morning. So I will go ahead and send out the notification from the planning department, and please feel free to tune in if that's something that's of interest to you. Thank you, Dan. Um, and I know we're just about out of time, but some, some people joined since we started the meeting. Are there any public comments? 
Does anyone have any? Michael, can I just add something really quick? If it's course, okay, for a quick minute. So thank you for reminding me, Dan, uh, about the leadership uh, in action town halls. Uh, we will be hosting one with the bid, and Chris is going to be the featured guest speaker uh, to promote to really promote the economic data that the Chris uh, that Chris has been producing with his team. So we're going to do one with the bid. We also have secure, we just heard back today and we got an okay from Ron Galperin. We're gonna do one in regards to the city budget and that's on July 10th. Um, we're also working at booking the next two council members we're working with are Kevin De Leon and um, Bob Lumenfield. And we're really expanding the outreach beyond our local city council member. As we know, when we need a motion to pass, it needs a little bit more support than our own Mitchell Farrell. Um, so we're really trying to expand our outreach to other council members and happy to have had Joe Buscano just did one. And um, the next two that will be coming up will be Kevin De Leon and Bob Lumenfield. Okay. Thanks, Rana. And I think uh, we're probably just about to lose the feed. So thank you, everyone. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.